there. Um, but I mean, if that is complicated, it also doesn't matter. Just I don't think if it it's, yeah. All right, so um, I think we've started recording. Uh, we can wait a couple of minutes and let um, people join. All right, so um, maybe just as a couple of people seem to still be coming in, um, maybe as that's happening, we can get started. So this uh, session is called Contemporary Topics in Classical Political Economy. I'm Layla Davis, I'm the chair, and we have three presentations today. Um, we have Luisa Nassif Pires and John Cogliano and Isabella Weber, and we're gonna go in the order um, of the program. And so we'll have presentations followed by questions for each presenter. Um, and, and we'll let Louisa start. Thank you so much, Leila. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Louisa Nassif Pires. I'm a research scholar at the Levy Economics Institute of Bard College. I'll be presenting today a chapter of my PhD thesis, which was defended at the New School for Social Research about two years ago, 2019. It's, yeah, the end of 2019, still two years ago. Uh, but uh, I wanna do a, a small uh, uh, note here. I've been in bed all week with COVID. I'm recovering slowly, uh, much better today already, thankfully. So after my presentation, I'll probably turn off the camera. I'll still be here, but uh, I, I just have been needing rest a lot and water. I hope everyone else is safe out there and take care of yourselves. It's, it's still very tough. So let me share my screen. Wait, that's not what I wanna do, sorry. I don't think, oh, is it on full screen for everyone now? Can you see the slides? No. We can see the slides, but it's not full screen. Oh. I mean, that's fine, we can see the slides. Okay. I don't know, it is on here. I don't know how to, it's always confusing. Okay, sorry. I'll go like that. So as I was mentioning, this is a chapter from my PhD uh, thesis. And as I was rereading today, I, I I wanted to dive back into it, take the week and rethink about some matters and prepare a well thought presentation. But uh, because of my health condition, I had no way of doing that. So I was going back to it today and I realized that there's a lot of it that I'm still, uh, I don't know, as I go back to it, I think about it a little more and it's very theoretical. Since I finished my PhD, I've been really focusing a lot on more applied things uh, and have shifted already my attention from other, like from, from Marxist theory to other things and more applied matters. So it's a good opportunity uh, to hear thoughts uh, as I am still preparing this to send for publication. And I don't know, one note that uh, I wanna make before I even start uh, and that I've noticed is that part of me is still lost between having spent so much time reading Marx and trying to understand what he meant or what he could have meant and trying to understand once we bring gender matters to his theory, what conclusions we get to within his framework or even finding certain uh, incoherences in his theory when you bring gender to it, that sometimes I even feel that I'm 
lost between what I really think, uh, you know, happens or the theory should be saying and what would be consistent within his theory or inconsistent within his theory. So I think those contradictions are, are going to come up because they're very much in my mind as well. Uh, so that's just a note for everyone. <laughs> Okay, uh, so the motivation for my thesis in general and for this chapter uh, really has a lot to do with the lack of diversity in economics discipline. Lisa, I'm sorry, I'm not oh. sure your slides are working. Did you move past the title? Oh, slide? I did. Okay, so I don't know. Wait, give me, let me stop the share. I'm sorry about it. Am I on the motivation slide now? No. Yeah. Okay, and now it's on full screen? Yes. And this works, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. My motivation for this in general uh, has to do with the lack of diversity in economics discipline. And my realization that in general, economic theory is very blind to gender, uh, gender matters and racial matters. And when identity issues are discussed, they're not usually part of the theory itself. There's a lot of applications, uh, which is also consistent with what I've been doing since. Uh, and they are extensively theorized within political science and sociology disciplines, but they're not really part of the theory in economics. Uh, and because of that, we end up having a difficulty in explaining certain patterns that you observe in economics, such as inequality and persistent wage differentials. Uh, within the theory, we can observe those, but we're always seeing that as a, a, a lack of sync of theory and application. Uh, and for me, uh, from a per personal perspective, uh, I've always been trying to join my political beliefs and my political practices with my academic practices. And the question that I brought to my thesis because of that is how we can build a successful social movement. So when, for example, getting, uh, getting involved in the unionization of student workers at the new school uh, and thinking of unionization matters in general and how I feel as a woman within union movements, uh, I started thinking of this question more and more. So uh, in the Communist Manifesto, uh, Marx and Engels, they point uh, once to the existence of competition between workers uh, and, uh, to that, they say that our pop is the buck of the bourgeoisie, possesses, however, the distinctive feature, it has simplified class antagonism. Society as a whole is more and more split into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And in general, in Marxist theory, we have the workers as this black box that is one uh, coherent group that would be fighting uh, against uh, the bourgeoisie. Uh, but there is very little opening to discuss within working class competition. And this is exactly what I try to do here. I don't wanna over, uh, overthink the fact that, uh, that they say that in the Communist Manifesto, it's a manifesto. So there is also a side of, uh, of trying to bring uh, homogeneity to the working class is, is Anyways, it's a way of trying to, to move forward with the movement. So this doesn't necessarily mean that they didn't think that actually, uh, that actually the competition between workers, uh, with that competition, workers would ever rise up against stronger, firmer, mightier. That doesn't necessarily mean it's an academic con uh, con uh, thing that they are saying, but uh, still, this is how the theory treats Marxist theory in general. And when we look into the data, uh, we, we also observe that the, there is some, uh, I don't know, there is some contradiction to that idea of the working class being uh, coherent or being uh, stronger together. Uh, so this is for the US uh, and we observe since the forties uh, an increase in the participation of women in the labor force. And at the same time, we observe a, de uh, a decrease in the unionization rate. Uh, and I mean, here there is no causality. I, I can I can prove that. There are other people. There is another paper that I work on this a little more and and stress more this point of trying to understand uh, if there is a difficulty of bringing women into a already established male unionization movement. 
and if this competition has made the movement uh, last strong. But what we can observe on the third graph is that there is more segregation, more gender segregation within the unions itself than within the occupations. So what you observe is that you have strong unions that are mostly female, strong unions that are mostly male, but you have a difficulty with unions that, that, that have a coherent uh, uh, group of men and women. So the question that I start from is what is the impact of the conflict within the working class to bargaining power and then consequently to the long run wage share. And I want to conceptualize this intertwinement between the economic and the social sphere from a political economy perspective and then discuss what the impact of identity constitution has in the value of labor power and consequently on the rate of exploitation. And for that, in the paper that I'm presenting, I'm focusing on gender. So the frameworks I'm using is political economy, mostly Marx, Marxist, social reproduction theory, and critical feminist theory. So the long run method, the long run, uh, sorry, the long period method uh, is focuses on, uh, on the classicals, uh, on a way of understanding the classicals through layers of complexity. Uh, so basically you would have more abstract layers where certain, uh, certain rules are happening, certain tendencies are happening, and you go to more concrete ones. Uh, and you would uh, be able to think of the movements of, uh, of or economic matters happening uh, in these different layers and counteracting each other. And uh, the most abstract layer uh, in the long period of method in the Marxist theory is the tendency to the, to the most abstract layer belongs the tendency of the rate of profit to fall in the long run. Uh, and in more concrete layers, we would have counter tendencies to that. So the idea is that in the most basic, uh, in, 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 in the absence of any other disturbance you would have that the profit rate on the long run would fall in the Marxist scheme, uh, but that there are things in more concrete layers, such as uh, rate of exploitation or changes in rate of exploitation that can counterbalance that. And you could observe a increasing rate of profit, for example. Uh, and Basically, what I try to do in this paper when I'm trying to read, uh, reread uh, the capital from a gender perspective is showing that uh, there is there is room to to disagree with that in that that uh, interpretation of it and understanding that to also a very abstract layer you could think that there is already a counterfact to the profit rate because there is there is this competition between workers. So once you accept the idea that there is competition between workers, and when you read closely Marx, you can see that he also sees uh, that technical change can create a certain tension between workers, then uh, it, uh, this counter tendency would actually belong also to a more abstract layer. So, the labor theory of value uh, for which all the argument depends uh, claims that labor creates all value and that labor power, which is the potential to perform labor can be bought on the market. And that the value of this labor power is governed by something different than uh, the value by which labor power is bought. So the value of labor power and wages can at times uh, be separate from each other. So the value of labor power is governed by the historically and socially determined amount of labor necessary to reproduce the labor power, which can be understood for some people as a subsistence wage, but one that is historically and socially determined. Uh, and because labor power can potentially produce more value than this necessary uh, labor to reproduce itself, there is room for accumulation and there is room for profits and there is room for exploitation. And so in a very simple scheme, what you would have is that the value of labor power is the necessary labor. Uh, and that 
could be what is paid uh, towards the labor time. So the value of labor power could at times coincide with wages. Uh, and uh, this, so the value of labor power could be seen as this natural value around wages are circulating. So at times they could uh, be distinct from each other, but there is a tendency of that to float around it. And, <coughs> and that labor that is paid a certain value produces more value than what it's paid. So there is a surplus labor or that can also be thought as time. So there is a time of the labor that uh, labor is producing above what it needs to reproduce itself. And therefore uh, this would be a surplus labor. And the struggle between the working class and the capitalist class in the Marxist scheme is what is gonna define where this line uh, is gonna lie within. So where the socially and historically determined necessarily labor necessary for it to produce itself is up for disagreement and it's up for a competition between workers and, uh, and, and capitalists to be defined. So the working class bargaining power is going to be essential to determine first who has an advantage in the struggle and then what is going to be the value of labor power and what is going to be wage eventually. So the existence of a surplus population as a Siemens Marx, uh, what constitutes what he calls a reserve army can affect this bargaining power. So when there are people that are not part of, uh, of the labor force, uh, but they're trying to be part of the labor force, this could decrease the bargaining power of workers. Uh, and also the existence of what uh, Nancy Fraser called boundary struggles or what I'm calling here within working class struggles can also affect the working class bargaining power. And Marx identifies three groups within, uh, within the reserve army, the flowing reserve, the latent reserve army, and the stagnant reserve army. And for our matters here, the latent reserve is gonna be very important because that's where many Marxists are gonna identify that, for example, women that are not part of the labor force yet would belong. So this is people that could be pulled into the labor force, but they're not yet in the labor force. So once you, you once the, sphere of production uh, of an economy is growing. This is bringing more people into the labor force and these people could be pulled in from this later reserve army. So I already said some of that. Uh, and Marx is pointing to the fact that the advancement of mechanized production is one of the things that allows for the employment of the broader range of the population. Uh, this is one of the points I've been struggling with today, if I actually agree with him or not, and that is very central for my argument, uh, but I'll come to that uh, in, in a bit. So women, children, older people, rural population, ethnic groups that have a low participation in the labor force, all of those can be seen as part of the latent reserve army. So this is one of the citations of Marx that is uh, important to this. Uh, so this is from Capital Volume 1, Chapter 15. The value of labor power was determined not only by the labor time necessary to maintain the individual adult labor, but also by that necessary to maintain his family. Machinery, by throwing every member of that family onto the labor market, spreads the value of the man's labor power over his whole family, it does depreciate his labor power. So here he's really putting uh, in, in technical change and the use of machinery, a role of actually creating a tension uh, and bringing this latent labor power into the labor force. To purchase the labor power of a family of four workers may perhaps cost more than it formerly did to purchase the labor power of the head of the family. But in return, four days, labor, but in return, four days labor takes the place of one and their price falls in proportion to the excess of the surplus labor of four over the surplus labor of one. In order that family may leave, four people must now not only labor, but expend surplus labor for the capitalist. Thus we see that machinery, while augmenting the human material that forms the principal object of capital's exploiting power, 
at the same time raises the degree of exploitation. So according to him here, technical change not only has a direct impact on bargaining power, but it also affects uh, the labor force composition. I'm gonna, I, I, I don't know how I'm doing with time, so I might. Um, I just put it in the chat, you have 10 minutes left. Okay, okay. So this is one, uh, one citation that goes in line with that uh, from 1854 uh, to the editors of the Philadelphia Daily News from Printers Union. The printers of the United States have uniformly opposed the introduction of women into printing offices for the following natural reasons. And uh, really natural is very important here that females can be employed at rates much lower than we demand and are properly entitled to. And as a consequence, employers would use them for the subversion of our national organization. Uh, so this really one of the points I'm, I'm trying to make with the paper is that there is this historical and social understanding that the value of the labor power of women would be lower than that of men because they would come as a extra for the family. So you have a certain change in the norm of the family at that point uh, where the male wage supposedly would cover the whole family. Uh, and according to Marx, machinery would throw more people into the labor force. But the value of the labor power of the people that are thrown into the labor force at that point, it's not the same because they are not there to reproduce themselves or reproduce the whole family, but just add to a wage that already exists of male. Uh, and this is also gonna create certain other dis disruptions uh, in, in, in the house, uh, which to understand, I need to actually jump into social reproduction theory for, uh, for a little bit. So, so social reproduction theory is a critique to Marxist theory, a feminist critique to Marxist theory. Uh, and it results as an attempt to look into the capitalist system uh, from the perspective of women. And one of the main consequences of, of changing this, uh, this point of view uh, is that the non-wage and the wage necessary labor cannot be dissociated from each other. So basically what they claim is that not only the labor that is performed within the productive sphere or within or paid by for wage, is labor. There is also a whole amount of labor that is disregarded or is invisible that is happening in the houses and that is mostly being done by women and that is unpaid, but that is actually labor that allows for the productive sphere to exist and that allows for the surplus value to exist. So when women take care of their children, for example, or they cook for their husbands uh, or they clean the house, they provide surplus value indirectly uh, because they are also uh, adding to the subsistence of those workers that are coming back to work and then producing value. So there would be a whole, uh, so to that scheme that I showed before, there is a whole other part that is invisible, which is this non-wage labor. Uh, so we can think of necessary labor actually as something that is augmented from the perspective of feminist uh, scholars. Uh, and not only that necessary labor that is performed uh, for, for wage. And there is a, uh, I mean, there's a lot of discussion as well in what is the norm of wages and there is a huge racial matter that I'm not pointing to here uh, because it's impossible to say something like the time when women enter the labor force, that's a very wide claim to be done. Uh, and uh, so, we are talking about a certain norm that is seen as, uh, as what happened at some time uh, and a very, anyways, the romanticized Marxist view of a industrial revolution when suddenly white women are entering the labor force. Uh, but for many populations, this doesn't make any sense at all. Women have always been part of the labor force. Uh, but in, in more theoretical terms, if you think of this scheme where you would have women at the house taking care of the children and cooking and men working for a wage, uh, what is called the breadwinner family regime, uh, you could think that the separation between the non-wage necessary labor and the wage uh, necessary labor 
it's a gender separation. So female is at home doing no wage necessary labor, male is outside doing necessary labor, and there is a surplus labor that is extracted from this male. So the exploitation of male is in a way much more visible than that of women, uh, while that of women is completely concealed behind this, this, uh, uh, this, this division, this artificial division between a productive and a reproductive sphere. So I'm not, I'm not gonna go there because that could take a while. <laughs> Uh, so at some point there is a disruption in this family regime, according to certain uh, historical readings of, uh, of uh, the, the Industrial Revolution. So domestic work, and, and this is actually a, uh, a, a footnote uh, from the quote that I had before, and it's one of the few times that, uh, that Marx is going to talk about uh, re social reproduction. Uh, labor. Domestic work such as sewing and mending must be replaced by the purchase of ready articles. This is the diminished expenditure. So really he's pointing here to the fact that women have been thrown. So uh, if you remember the quote before, it said that machinery has thrown women into the labor force. Uh, and besides the fact that this creates a competition between workers and creates an imbalance uh, in the wage and in the value of labor power within the productive sphere, there is also something that happens in the reproductive sphere that really is just delegated to a footnote. So domestic work such as sewing and mending must be replaced by the purchase of ready-made articles. Hence, the diminished expenditure of labor in the house is accompanied by an increased expenditure of money. The cost of keeping the family increases and balances the greater income. In addition to this, economy and judgment in the consumption and preparation of the means of subsistence becomes impossible. So, Besides the fact that when women enter the labor force uh, with a understanding, a norm understanding that the value of their labor power is not supposed to really reproduce themselves, but just add to a male wage, uh, it also creates a disruption in the family itself. Because once they do start working outside the home, there is no one to keep doing this no wage necessary labor. So what you would have is that at that point, women would also have a participation in the necessary labor that is paid, but that would have a smaller value of labor power. Uh, so they're being paid less. Uh, they are still performing more non-wage necessary labor, while Mayo are performing a smaller part of non-wage necessary labor, if any, being paid a little more. Uh, and this is not really, so this difference in the value of labor power this is not something that can continue over time. So there is actually an equalizing force because we know that women and men, they are equally capable of doing the work. So with time, it is impossible to maintain this discrepancy on wages. So there is a certain equalization movement. Uh, and here I'm abstracting from something else, which is also very important uh, to explain a possible, uh, a possible continuation on this uh, differences in the understanding of the value of the labor of different people, uh, which uh, one of them is occupation segregation. So if women keep occupying themselves in one thing and men in another, it's possible to maintain these differences for longer time in terms of the market. So the problem is that uh, this equalization process, it's very hard or actually it's impossible to understand how this is gonna equalize. Is it the value of labor power of men that is gonna fall and meet that of women? Is the value of labor power of women that is gonna increase? One cannot really think of that without taking into account also the reproductive sphere. So those two spheres are completely intertwined and there is no theoretical way of really analyzing what happens in the productive sphere by disregarding the unproductive sphere the reproductive sphere, sorry. So one of the main critiques to Marx in the sense is that it's impossible to be uh, theoretically coherent uh, and create a, a, a theory that will explain those matters without taking that fully into account. Uh, I'm gonna jump that. So, Bargaining power, uh, which is very important to explain where we're going to set that line, where is going to be the value of labor power, 
uh, according, uh, so according to the mark citations, we can understand that technical change actually disrupts this artificial separation between productive and unproductive labor. So the gender division between the paid and unpaid necessary labor, it becomes uh, a bit more blurred once women are thrown into the labor force. And according to him, part of the reason of that is technical change itself. So it becomes really hard to maintain the idea that technical change, which belongs to this more abstract layer and is part of explaining why the value of, uh, of the rate of profit would fall over time, does not also create things that are pertaining in his understanding to more concrete layers, such as uh, the bargaining power. So women enter the labor force with this lower value of labor power, which leads to a displacement of workers or and fall in overall value of labor power. Unless bargaining power between workers and capitalists would lead to an increase in this wage or, well, first in the value of labor power and then uh, in wage. But it's impossible to separate the class struggles uh, between classes from what happens within the working class. So basically, to under I, I can't understand what's happening on the productive sphere, which is uh, in black here, without also analyzing what is happening in the gray sphere here. So there is no, there is no possibility of thinking of equalization process in one sphere without fully taking into account the other. So there, are, I, I understand that there are three dialectical processes that are themselves intertwined here and fitting each other. Uh, so there is this equalization process of the, uh, of the value of labor power. Uh, so there is interactions of a market and a non-market sphere of a capitalist class, between a capitalist class and a working class and an active workforce and a latent reserve army. So my conclusions are that the production of gender as a category has been established in a violent way and is functional for capitalism. I jumped a little bit this part, uh, the part where I discuss Federici and some other uh, writers that understand uh, that the primitive accumulation is also, there is also a type of primitive accumulation that has led women uh, to be exploited or expropriated within the economy. Uh, but part of the argument is that production itself, the productive sphere itself, and the process of accumulation itself is a way of, uh, of creating, uh, sorry, of creating uh, a category such as gender and uh, creating this disruption. The existence of this category both allows the system to appropriate surplus, increase the exploitation rate, and divide the working class. So uh, this is a very uh, effective way of increasing uh, the surplus labor. And historically, trades unions have actually been a conservative force regarding the social norm and not really a progressive force. And they have used as a way of maintaining privileges and excluding women from certain activities. This is, this is very well uh, reported historically. I didn't bring much of that here today, but there's a bit more of that in the paper itself. So for the theory, the consequences is that the existence of these marginalized groups is an important parameter to understand bargaining power, and it should be part of models. So if we are doing, for example, a model where the working class uh, equation comes from a Marxist understanding, if you start by saying that working class is just one solid group, uh, you are oversimplifying it. So it's at least you need to understand what that means for your results. Uh, so mar market macroeconomic models that encapsulates this labor market cannot think of workers as a uniform group. I think that's it. Uh, so I think I can, let's, I, I think I'm out of time, right, Leila? Yeah, so I'll, I'll just stop at that. Thank you so much. Thank you. So um, we can take questions um, in the q and I can give people a second to um, type, type any questions that we have. Hello, Lisa. Or if anyone would like to raise their hand, I can um, allow you to talk. <laughs> I 
I'll just give people a minute in case people are typing. And we can also always come back at the end um, if there's time for a general discussion. All right, so well, maybe what we'll do is we'll we'll move to John, and then at the end of the session, if that's okay, Lisa, if there are more questions at that time, we yeah, can come back. Yeah, thank you. All right, thank you for a great presentation. All right, so next we have um, Jonathan Cogliano, and I will let you introduce your title. <laughs> Okay, are those slides showing up okay? Okay, all right, Great. thank you. Uh, okay, so uh, I am presenting a very, uh, a paper that I'm working on with my co-authors, Roberto Veneziani and Naoki Yoshihara. Um, and this is still very preliminary work. Um, so, and I'll kind of address that as I go through the presentation. Um, but basically uh, the main idea of what we're doing in this paper is that we are uh, working on a project where we're developing an agent-based computational simulation of the classical Marxian approach to competitive prices. And uh, this is, uh, part of a, a project we're kind of prompted to uh, work on where uh, for a, a, another conference uh, where we attempt to agentize or build an agent-based computational simulation of some kind of conventional or what is could be considered a well-received or sort of settled uh, concept in economic theory. Um, and so, what we're doing in this is uh, because the classical political economists and Marx uh, arguably considered capitalist economies to be large systems uh, with large numbers of degrees of freedom characterized by open ended uh, dynamics. Uh, we know that they also considered equilibrium prices to be centers of gravity for fluctuations in market prices and these kinds of centers of gravity really only emerged over long periods of time through the kind of decentral through decentralized decisions and interactions of agents. Uh, so this kind of vision of prices as these centers of gravity uh, or attractors uh, is something that's not really captured in conventional treatments of uh, in the, using a classical Marxian framework. A typical approach is to just work from long period prices uh, for analytical purposes. So what we're doing in this is we're building an agent-based computational model to try to capture the kind of open-ended dynamics that we can find descriptions of in the classicals and Marx. Uh, there have been a couple other uh, earlier attempts at uh, something similar to this. Uh, so there's a couple of agent-based models done, one by Ian Wright, uh, one I did earlier, but these are uh, much simpler uh, agent-based models than what we're currently attempting, where, uh, and, and I'll explain that in just a minute, and uh, something that's not an agent-based simulation, but sort of related to what we're doing here is the cross-dual dynamics literature, uh, which treats these kinds of uh, you know, gravitation processes uh, as in, in uh, dynamical systems. Um, and I apologize for anybody watching me as I keep turning my head. I'm feeding my toddler cookies to keep him occupied while I present. Um, so that's just to explain for the viewers. Um, so there's a uh, there's a tradition viewing of their viewing uh, accepting kind of strong similarities between the classicals and Marx in terms of their theories of price and value. This is usually based on some notion 
of the labor theory of value. This is usually arguably most well known through the example of Smith's early and rude state of society thought experiment in which you have many commodity producers who use labor as their only input in production and they produce one of two goods at a time. This is Smith's famous beaver deer example. So you have your beaver producers and your, your deer producers, they you know can produce one of the two goods at a time and then they can then exchange across sectors. If the prices at which they exchange are not consistent with the labor time needed to produce the goods, their producers are going to migrate across sectors until they are. This continuous movement of producers across sectors uh, is viewed as ongoing and the labor theory of value equilibrium where relative prices are proportional to relative labor times is viewed as emerges as a center of gravity for the movement in market prices. Now this is a simplified version of the general classical Marxian approach to prices uh, for that simple Smithian case you have a single input that only labor in the production process. And that's, tip, that's, the, that's the kind of agent-based model uh, in this kind of tradition that's been attempted before. So both the one by Ian Wright and myself that have done, been done before, those are uh, much more kind of Smithian than, uh, and really only deal with labor as a, the only input in production rather than a, the more general case uh, involving both labor and capital. So this simple example of the labor theory value or Smith's early and rude state thought experiment can be generalized to many goods and can also be extended to include capital. In this more expanded case, you have workers and capitalists who migrate across sectors until wage and profit rates equalize. And this is what is thought of as the kind of classical competitive process. The equilibrium prices that uh, emerge from this or that are consistent with this classical competitive process, uh, they ensure a uniform profit rate across industries. Now, uh, there are plenty of well-known issues with the labor theory of value, but these kind of classical prices can be a pretty useful analytical tool. And you know, for our current audience, we are pretty familiar with all of their the ways in which they're used. Um, so the standard treatment of these prices, just uh, to be sure we're all on the same page, uh, in an end good world, uh, usually goes something like this, where you assume you have a linear circulating capital economy, you have P denoting your vector of prices, A is your matrix of capital requirements and production, and L is your vector of labor requirements. W and R respectively denote wage and profit rates that are assumed to be uniform across industries or across sectors, reflecting that long period equilibrium. So then we write down our competitive prices as follows, depending on whether uh, wages are paid before or after production takes place. So building an agent-based computational simulation of this with many agents means that we're building a, a simulation where you have many agents who are going to be making decisions about production, exchange, and how to allocate their productive capacity across multiple sectors of the economy. Now, to do this based on this, uh, the kind of standard approach to classical Marxian prices, um, this requires filling in a number of gaps. Uh, mo our, perhaps most importantly, is we have to figure out some kind of system or mechanism for exchange. In the classicals and Marx, the details of how exchange actually takes place between agents is unclear at best. Uh, we also have to come up with a, an, a, a, some kind of mechanism or set of mechanisms for through which agents decide how to migrate across industries. Um, and in the classicals and Marx, we really only just have the idea that capital is going to migrate across industries in response to profit rate differentials, but we don't have a whole lot more detail than that. There are also some issues about the timing and sequencing of the, of the simulation, about when do markets meet, uh, because the, uh, the, price, the long period prices or competitive prices are the, both the prices of inputs and outputs. So do these markets all meet simultaneously or in sequence? And so there's some issues to sort out there as well. But I think that those are like uh, arguably secondary to the kind of the first two problems of figuring out exchange and intersectoral mobility. So these are kind of the main difficulties in building the kind of simulation that we're 
working on here. So in terms of the framework that we have, um, we start from the simplified case of a too good world. We have a linear uh, circulating capital economy with a Leon TF technology, and we denote time periods with a subscript T. We have a set of agents denoted by the script N, and where new denotes an individual agent in the set. The set of agents is partitioned into capitalists and workers, and the with the number of capitalists denoted like so. Any uh, agent in the subset of capitalists has some endowments denoted by omega. Um, and capitalists invest all of their profits they do not consume. Workers uh, in how we've set up the simulation so far are essentially passive and they inelastically supply labor at uh, the subsistence wage given by the or a subsistence bundle. Uh, workers do not save and they do not accumulate. And we also assume that wages are paid before production. Because of this, we can basically just write down uh, the production requirements uh, for our model or our simulation as this as the matrix M, uh, just denoted as follows, where bold lowercase m denotes any column of the larger M matrix. At the start of, a time, of any time period, uh, capitalists are going to enter the market with their endowments uh, to exchange in order to have the inputs to operate the technology. So during any time period T, capitalists are also going to be committed from the beginning of the time period to operating in one of the two sectors. And this is something that's decided at the beginning of the time period and doesn't change within the time period. So capitalists are kind of committed to operating in one of the two sectors at a time. They only switch between the time periods. Now, uh, script N sub I is the subset of capitalists operating in sector I during any time period T. So any agent in this, any agent operating in sector I or sector one, because we have a too good world, is going to enter the market with their endowments and with some expected prices. Now, the expected prices at the beginning of the simulation are determined randomly, and they're consistent with, uh, they're determined such that any agent operating in sector I has a profit rate that is positive and is also greater than or at least equal to the profit rate in the other sector or their expected profit rate in the other sector. We also normalize all prices such that they sum to one. So we use these price expectations to determine each agent's input demand denoted by Y. For each, agent, each, each agent's input demand is then used to calculate or determine their trade function tau. Now, the trade functions tau are going to help us determine which side of a market each agent is on during each time period of the simulation. So any agent who has a positive quantity of good I in their endowment and zero of good J, they're going to have, a, they're going to wind up being a net supplier of good I and a demander of good J. Each agent begins the simulation, begins each time period holding only one of the two goods. They hold the good in the sector for, to which they're committed to operating. And so at, at the first time the market meets, these agents are gonna then have to get some of the other good in order to be able to operate the technology and produce goods. So the trade function, Trade functions tau are used to determine which side of the market agents are on, or to partition the set of capitalists into sides of the market. So the way exchange works is we check agents' trade functions, split the subset of capitalists into different sides of the market, and then we randomly pair agents across the two sides of the market. So any agent new supplying good I is going to be matched with another agent mu who supplies good J. Now, because there can be uneven numbers of agents in on different sides of the market, we may have a situation where some agents cannot be paired uh, the first time that the market meets during any time period. These agents are going to be placed into temporarily placed into another subset U. 
We check the endowments of any pairs of agents, nu and mu, to be sure that an exchange is possible. Any for which an exchange is not possible, those pairs are then placed into the unpaired set. And then we also make an attempt to rematch agents who were unable to make a trade or uh, unpaired from the start, just to see, hopefully we can get as many trades or exchanges as possible happening during every time period. Viable, pair, viable pairs of traders, nu and mu, uh, are then, then exchange at prices P, such that there's no excess demand for either good I or good J, between the two agents. So the age, each pair of agents are going to figure out equilibrium prices between the two agents. These are not equilibrium prices for the whole economy, just equilibrium prices for those two agents. So th these agents, they're pairs of traders, figure out their pri equilibrium prices. They then trade accordingly. And then any agents who um, trade can then go on to produce. So this exchange procedure runs until all pairs of agents who can trade uh, do so. Any agents who successfully exchange and complete a trade are going to remember their exchange prices uh, in order to determine their profit rate during the current time period, and they're going to use their exchange prices to update their expected prices for the next time period. Any agents, ADA, who were unable to trade or were unpaired during this meeting of the market during this time period, they're going to be assigned placeholder prices that are consistent with a zero profit rate in the sector in which they are operating. These placeholder prices are then going to be these agents or unpaired agents expected prices during the next time period. At the end of exchange, all the agents update their endowments to reflect the exchanges uh, and make their trades. And endowments after exchange takes place are denoted by omega prime here. Now, once exchange has take, taken place, then production can occur. So any agents or all of the agents who are able to successfully complete a trade during any given time period and thus hold both of the goods, they can then produce. So any agent who, and who after exchange has their endowments omega prime, you can use their endowments and the technology M to produce. Uh, so any agent in sector I, they produce some quantity X of good i. They then update their output vector x as follows. They update their endowments to reflect any inputs consumed in the course of production. And then their endowments at the end of the time period t are just omega sub t, which reflect their output vector or anything that they've produced and any endowments that they might have left over after production. Any agents who did not exchange, uh, they do not produce, and they just carry their any endowments that they have over to the next time period. After production uh, concludes, agents are then going to evaluate whether or not they want to produce in the a different or the other sector during the next time period. So any agent operating in sector I is going to compare their own individual profit rate to the average profit rate in the other sector. So agents uh, figure out uh, the likelihood uh, with which they're going to, or determine the likelihood with which they're going to switch uh, using a logistic fun function. So they calculate this psi here, where, which is a function of how far their individual profit or how different their individual profit rate is from the average profit rate in the other sector. If their individual, if an agent's individual profit rate is really is just way less than the average profit rate in the other sector, they, they're gonna have a much higher chance of migrating to the other sector. 
How am I doing on time? Oh, there it is. Time. Yeah, great. All right. Um, so after agents calculate this psi or the likelihood with which they're going to switch to the other sector, they compare this to some threshold rho. If psi is greater than or equal to rho, they're going to switch to produce in the other sector during the next time period. If it's less than rho, they could maintain or continue producing or operating in the sector to which they are currently assigned. Um, if by any chance an agent has a negative profit rate during any time period, they're automatically going to switch to the other sector during the next time period. And if agents do switch sectors, they update their expected prices to be prices that are consistent with the average profit rate in the other sector or the sector to which they are switching. Now, um, so like I said, a lot of uh, this work is still pretty preliminary. We have uh, the kind of framework fleshed out for how uh, we want to approach this. And we have some preliminary results, um, but there's still, uh, which I'll discuss in a minute, but there are still quite a few things that we want, need to work through with this um, or things that we might want to see behave a little differently. Um, but basically, I can, I'm just going to walk through a few sample results of this. So the, eight, the simulation is all built in Mathematica. Um, we run, have so far have run this simulation um, for cases considering no technical change or a fixed technique. Um, we run this with most of our runs. We just run with 100 agents or 100 capitalists to keep things uh, simple, at least. We generally, or at least for the results I'll show here, we begin the simulation out of equilibrium. So we have an uneven number of agents in the two sectors. And then we have a range for the kind of random a, ra a range over which uh, agents' initial endowments are randomly determined here. And we also assume, at least initially, we assume a uniform row or that threshold that agents use to decide whether or not they're going to switch sectors during any time period. Now, um, so far in our preliminary simulation runs, we've gotten a uh, some results where we can compare relative exchange prices, uh, which down in the bottom of the panel on the left at the bottom here, all of the relative exchange prices are these different colored dots. We can look at the relative uh, average market price, which is the red line here. And we can compare this to equilibrium relative price here, which is the, these are the prices consistent with a uniform profit rate across the two sectors. And we can also take a look at the allocation of capitalists across the two sectors here. Now, one thing that uh, we can see pretty quickly in these results is that we get some gravitation of average, uh, average market prices around the equilibrium, but it's not really kind of the tight gravitation around a center of gravity that we you kind of expect or see described in, uh, by the classicals and Marx. So there's some things, um, it's not quite what we would expect that, you know, but there's a number of reasons for, as to why that could be a number of refinements that we could can still make. Um, here, these are, uh, these are results from the same simulation run as the previous slide. I'm just basically taking in, taking a close up of the prices here, right? And then zooming in on everything happening below that equilibrium relative price line here over in the top right panel. Uh, one thing you can also notice is a lot of the exchange prices seem to be really happening below uh, this line here. And one thing that we also see is that the profit rate in sector two kind of remains consistently above the profit rate in sector one. So we're not really seeing that equalization of profit rates that we might expect, right? at least for these kind of, this kind of initial first pass. Um, 
here are some sample results from another run using the same parameters, just a different run of the simulation. Right, and you can see some very similar results where we get we get movement of average market price around that equilibrium, but not kind of quite as we would expect. And we have kind of qualitatively similar behavior of the profit rates across the two sectors. Um, I'm going to just skip ahead to the conclusions real quick, just because I just have a few minutes left. But um, so. Uh, what we've kind of set out to do here, and again, this is all still work in progress, uh, is we set out to build this agent-based computational simulation of a classical Marxian approach to prices. And one thing we kind of stuck to, and we've stuck to so far at least, as we've been building this framework and building the first kind of set of simulations that we're doing, is we've tried to stick as closely as we can to the kind of implied behavior or implied rational behavior that we see in the classicals and Marx, because we think in the descriptions of how capitalists behave there, there's some kind of rational behavior, profit-seeking behavior described. So we've kind of stuck to that behavior as close as we can uh, in building out the exchange procedure and building out the uh, algorithm for determining how capitalists switch or move across sectors. Um, so there is some room to kind of, you know, think about refining that quite a bit. So there's different options for exchange procedures that we can explore. We could also, or would probably like to think a little more carefully about the how agents or how capitals decide to migrate across sectors. They could also undertake different production decisions. We could introduce capitalist consumption. Introducing technical change would be pretty straightforward in this framework as well. And we could also start incorporating uh, worker behavior and make you know make workers less passive than they are in the current setup. And I will end there. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Um, all right, so maybe what we'll do is we'll take um, just, oh, there's a whole bunch of questions. Um, John, if you would like to look at the questions in the chat, and if you think there are any that are sort of clarifying questions that would be good to take now, maybe we could take a couple of minutes to do that. And if there's any that are longer, we could perhaps save more general discussion for the end. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so uh, Gregor's question about uh, sector-specific fixed capital. Um, and I, I yeah, also so, don't think that the audience can read the questions. Oh, they can't. Okay. So you. Okay. Might so I'll repeat them then. So uh, Gregor's question is: How would uh, the analysis that uh, we have here uh, address the existence of sector-specific fixed capital, which is, can be uh, important empirically? Uh, so uh, our the analysis or framework we have here isn't terribly well suited to doing that because we're working with a circulating capital economy. Um, but if we were to build this out to include something like sector specific fixed capital, uh, things would get a, quite a bit more complex and quite a bit trickier, I think, because then it would be really difficult to have a well functioning capital market. Uh, that would allow capitalists to switch sectors. So the decision or how they would think about switching sectors, I think would need quite a bit of um, refinement, if not to be totally rethought in that situation. So I'm not quite sure how we would approach addressing something like that yet, um, but that's, that's a, I think that's a, the point's well taken. So I think that that's something we'll discuss. Um, and there's a question from uh, Daniele. Uh, it says two quick reactions. One, how do profit rate differentials depend on different capital intensities across sectors? And two, um, why don't profit rates uh, equalize given that wages are identical across sectors? Um, so one, th so, okay, so, I think the bigger, kind of the bigger quick react or quick response to those is that we're not totally quite sure yet why the profit rates aren't equalizing. Part of it could be because the way that the capitalists look at 
the decision of whether or not to switch is they currently factor in zero profit rates in determining the average um, the average profit rate um, across in the other sector. And so that could be part of it. And we just haven't, I, I really haven't had the time to explore this too thoroughly yet. So I think that's a big part of it is that the calculation of, or decisions of how to switch or whether or not to switch include zero profit rates and averages of the profit rate in the other sector. So that need, probably needs some rethinking. And um, that's kind of the biggest sticking point that we've kind of been sticking on or thinking through this. Also, um, there's probably other ways we could conceive of thinking about the differential uh, or how the capitals kind of perceive the differential or um, the fact that they only look at their own individual profit rate and average in the other sector without considering where they are relative to their own sector. So there's a, a few different things worth kind of thinking through about how we might go about refining that. Great, thank you, John. Um, there's also a number of questions that have come in for Louisa, but I think we can save that for some general discussion at the end and any other ones that come in for John, we can, um, we can address then as well. And um, then next we have our third presenter of the day, uh, Isabella Weber. And I believe she has a different title than the one on the, um, on the program. So uh, thank you, Isabella. Sorry, I think you're muted. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Lila. Thank you. Um, okay. Um, so I do indeed have a different uh, paper which has to do with the events in the recent um, days. I will um, briefly go into the question of um, Smithian trade theory, but will, in, in, for the main part, um, present a paper that is by now um, quite, quite far developed. So the title of this paper is Persistence in Productive Capabilities Across Two Eras of Globalization. Um, okay, for some reason, yeah. This paper basically tries I'm to sorry, address- I'm sorry. I'm sorry, did you go to the next slide? I heard something beep. It didn't- I did, yeah. It didn't, it doesn't show. Okay, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, can you see the second slide now? You stop sharing your screen, I think. Okay, so can you see the second slide now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe I just stay um, out of the first screen mode if it's not moving. Okay. okay. So <laughs> maybe I should just start all over again um, to not lose my audience here. The title of this paper is Persistence in Productive Capabilities Across Two Eras of Globalization. This draws on by now years of work jointly with Gregory Semenyuk, Tom Westland, and Chun Chang Liang. This work has been in parts um, sponsored by Rebuilding Macroeconomics, um, which is part of the Economic and Social Research Council um, in the UK, and in parts um, by the Political Economy Research Unit here at UMass. So one of the similar questions in economics is of course, why are some countries rich and others poor? And in fact, this question has been picked up again in recent um, years in the so-called persistence literature that tries to explain today's economic performance as originating in some sort of distant past. So basically explanations of today's dif different levels in income by pointing to some historical event um, in, in, in a fairly distant past. Most of these studies focus on fundamentals such as institutions, geography, culture, 
and unfortunately some of them even on genetics as drivers of such persistence. So all of these fundamentals that are typically being examined in the persistence literature are broadly speaking um, factors that are not um, economic factors in a more narrow sense. So it's trying to explain today's most important economic outcomes with basically non-economic factors pointing back to a very distant past. So what we are trying to do in this paper is to speak to the persistence literature, but bring back um, economic insights um, in a way that in this paper is basically um, building on fairly mainstream economic theories, but as I'll show in a little excursion in the next couple of slides, can I think also be connected to classical political economy, which was what I meant to present um, for, for, for this um, session today, but due to the events in, in the last um, couple of days did not get around to doing in the way I had envisioned. Okay, so if we start um, from the inside that long run growth rates can differ due to competitive competitiveness in good or bad sectors, as for example, Young has argued, Hausman, Huang and Roderick have argued, but also in a recent paper by Atkin and Cosino Fukui, Fukui have argued, we would expect that initial conditions in productive capabilities would matter due to factors such as learning by doing and spillovers. So if initially you were exporting good stuff, you have an initial advantage and this initial advantage just reproduces itself, which then resides in some sort of persistent inequality in income levels rather than a process of convergence. So what we are doing in this project is to basically take today's economic performance and link it back to the previous globalization, that is the globalization at the end, um, towards the end of the 19th century, and link this to path dependence in productive capabilities, where we think of productive capabilities as the thing, the dynamic that is driving the persistence in unequal income le levels. But before I dive more into this, I want to take uh, make a little excursion into Smithian trade theory, um, uh, since I, I realize that this audience certainly has a lot to say um, on, on, on that aspect of my work. Okay, so Smithian trade theory, I believe, is one possible angle that can explain why the global division of labor um, results in persistent inequality in income levels. So in the literature on Smithian trade theory, there are broadly speaking three interpretations. The first one is the absolute cost interpretation, which um, Anwar Sheikh and I have also published a, a paper on um, recently, where the emphasis is on the insight that from a Smithian perspective, the absolute advantage in export sectors does not turn into a comparative advantage if we do not assume the quantity theory of money as Ricardo does. So if we don't have a quantity theory of money, absolute advantages do not automatically turn into comparative advantages. Now, if absolute advantages do not turn into comparative advantages, we would expect that free trade creates persistent trade imbalances rather than um, a, a, a natural tendency towards trade balance. And this tendency of persistent trade imbalance, in fact, shows up in the data for the first and for the current globalization. That is, the more market global market integration you have, the bigger the global um, imbalances. The second interpretation of Smithian trade theory emphasizes un even development, which is consistent with the idea of absolute cost, um, sorry, with the absolute cost interpretation in the sense that these kind of imbalances can be linked to uneven development. This uneven development interpretation, as for example, articulated by Mund, Elmsley and Wilberg, focuses on sector level specializations where the North exports manufacturing goods and the South exports agricultural goods. And um, this, these different sectoral specializations are then what results in uneven development due to unequal gains from trade 
where if you export manufactured goods, you gain more than if you export agricultural goods. The third interpretation is the so-called jack of all trades interpretation, which has been articulated by Schumacher, for example, in his 2019 paper, where he's arguing that based on the natural course of opulence argument in Smith, the extension of the market through international trade would deepen the do domestic mechanical division of labor. And since this happens for each and every country, for each and every country, international trade leads to an ever greater division of labor, he argues that will broadly spe speaking lead to convergence. Okay, now I am suggesting that basically the absolute cost interpretation, uneven development interpretation, and the diversification aspect of the check of all trade interpretation can be combined in a consistent fashion. So my attempt in this part of my work has been to show that the absolute advantage interpretation can be combined with the uneven development interpretation and the check of all trade interpretations as I have just argued. Okay, how do I come to this suggestion? Um, if we take the division of labor as being limited by the extent of the market, which is one of the core arguments in Smith, then the extension of the market through international trade would of course deepen the division of labor, just as Schumacher in his check of all trades um, argumentation suggests. However, and I think this is the key point, this is only true insofar as a country has absolute advantages. If a country does not have an absolute advantage in certain goods, then the extension of the market could in fact kill part of the diversification because it would start importing these foreign goods and therefore reducing its diversification, which is the basic notion um, that underpins all calls of, um, for, for protectionist path to development. Okay, so the idea of the natural course of opulence in Smith is to move that is that there is a, a, a path of development that involves moving from agriculture to manufacturing to trade. And in fact, historically, and Smith makes this very clear, this path is modeled on the Chinese experience um, looking back from the 18th century. So the idea then is in the natural course of opulence that um, countries only engage in trade when they have gained competitiveness in manufacturing goods so that they do not um, engage in trade at a time when they would lose um, internal division of labor from trade. Smith then distinguishes a second course to opulence, which he calls the retrograde and unnatural course to opulence of mercantilism, where, backward, where a backward country is trying to leapfrog into monopolistic colonial trade and to develop industry through technology transfers. He's of course talking about the United Kingdom, which largely relied, as he suggests, on technology imports from the East and on the forced opening of markets in the rest of the world. This then can set off a virtuous cycle of development within that leapfrogging country, as has happened in, in the Netherlands and England, but on the flip side, results in a forced opening of markets in countries that are not yet at a stage in their quote unquote natural course of opulence where they should be engaging in trade. So if all countries were to follow a natural course of opulence, there would be convergence, just as Rainer Schumacher Schuma has argued, and then trade would be beneficial to all. However, if some countries are forced off this, um, this natural past path and forced into an unnatural course due to some powerful countries pursuing this retrograde course to opulence, the result of trade is instead uneven development. And this uneven development, I think one can show, involves both a dynamic on the trade balance, 
but also in relation to export diversification, where some countries um, will be systematically exporting limited to the export of agricultural goods since they enter trade at a point in their development where they could only export agricultural goods. Whereas on the other hand, countries that were exporting manufactured goods would enjoy the, um, the virtues um, the, the virtual cycle that is unleashed by an um, extension of the division of labor through trade, thanks to their more advanced um, state of development. From this perspective, then, we would think that a Smithian trade theory leads us to expect that if these are the initial conditions where some countries are forced open too early, and this resides in a virtual cir circle um, on the part of the um, uh, the, the more developed countries at the point of opening and a vicious circle um, on the part of those who were forced open too early, we would expect that there's a hierarchy of diversification that will be relatively persistent. Okay, so, so much on my excursus on the Smithian trade theory. And let me now go back to our empirical work and the main paper that I'm trying to present here. So for this paper, and some of you have seen this before, we have constructed a database um, with um, commodity level export data for the first era of globalization, recording um, the global commodity level country exports for pretty much the whole world for 10 years from 1896 to, sorry, 1897 to 1906, which is, um, part of what we argue is broadly speaking, the high point of the first globalization. Um, this, and I skip over this, but this like hugely increases the, the data coverage um, of, of, of what had existed before this project. Okay, to link this back to the question of diversification and the question of whether we have a territorial division of labor, where some countries export um, agricultural goods and other countries export manufacturing goods, or whether we have a hierarchy of diversification where some countries pretty much export everything and other countries are limited to a very small number of basically primary um, type of commodities in the first globalization. I think that this graph plotting our data is pretty informative. So the, the SITC codes here that are plotted in, 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 in bluish um, are basically um, parts of subcategories of, of um, manufacturing goods. And the blue line indicates the share of manufacturing goods in exports. The red dots in this graph indicate the level of diversification, that is the, the, the number of distinct commodities exported by a country. And I think we can see that broadly speaking, there is a correlation between how much countries are exporting in terms of manufacturing goods and how many different kinds of things they are exporting, okay? So in that sense, it's not a great specialization as the first globalization has been called where some countries specialize in manufactured goods and others in agriculture, but instead those that are exporting agricultural goods are very specialized, they lack diversification, but those that are exporting manufactured goods also export agricultural goods in a very, very wide range of different kinds of goods. So they are enjoying very high levels of diversification. Now, why would that matter for the question of capabilities? It matters for the question of productive capabilities in so far as that the ability of a country to export a very diverse set of com commodities suggests that within this country, there is productive capability that can produce this kind of stuff in a way that is internationally cost competitive, okay? So we are taking the fact that a country can export a whole range of stuff as an indication, as if you want so a revealed productive um, capability as measured by the competitiveness um, on the world market. 
So in that sense, this hierarchy and diversification can also be thought of as a hierarchy in productive capabilities. So what we are doing in this paper, and I realized that I have to hurry up. How much time do I have, Laila? Um, you still have, you have about 13 minutes. 13? Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so what we are doing in this paper is that we are using export-based proxies for productive capabilities. On the one hand, diversification, and on the other, economic complexity to study the persistence in productive capabilities. So the idea is that what countries export shows us um, what they can produce in a competitive fashion. So from that, we can infer their productive capabilities in relation to the world market. And then we measure these productive capabilities in the exact same way for the first and second globalization, which is possible because we have constructed this data in a way that is consistent with modern trade data sets. So one question is that we study is the persistence and productive capabilities themselves. And the second question that we study is to what extent do productive capabilities in the first globalization predict GDP per capita levels today? Okay, on the first question, that is the persistence and productive capability, if we look at our first measure, which is export diversification, this is a simple scatter plot where you have export diversification in the current globalization and export diversification in the, in the first globalization. Um, and we can see that there's a pretty strong um, relationship between the two. A more advanced measure based on export data of productive capabilities is economic complexity. And I'm happy to discuss that measure in the q and if anyone is interested. But the basic idea is to not only look at the number of different things that countries are exporting, but also come up with an algorithmic um, measure that, um, that, that includes information on what kind of stuff uh, uh, countries are exporting based on um, the information that one has from export data, which other countries are exporting the same things. Okay, so for economic complexity, we basically see a very similar picture as for um, diversification. Now, if we look at the relationship between economic complexity in the first globalization here on the x-axis and real GDP per capita um, in the, the, the ongoing globalization, we again, like just as descriptive evidence, get a, a pretty strong correlation. Okay, in the paper, we then move on to start with a simple OLS regression, um, controlling for a bunch of things that are typically um, considered as drivers of diversification. We basically find that what I've just shown you as descriptive evidence carries over into the OLS regression. Okay, but it might be the case that our export-based proxies in the first and second um, globalization are driven by persistent factors such as geography and institution, which prevailed at the end of the 19th century and at the end of the 20th century, and therefore are the underlying cause um, of, of, of what we are looking here, right? So we want to rule out that it's not simply the case that geography and institutions or other persistence factors determine export-based proxies um, in the first globalization, and then the same persistent factors det determine them in the present globalization, which, um, which, which would then reside in a very different um, uh, uh, persistent mechanism than the one that we are trying to, um, to, to unpack here. So to do this, um, we control for geography and we control for constraint on executive, which is one of the most commonly used proxy for um, institutions. And we basically find that this does not affect our results. We also um, then have constructed two different measures of uh, colonial heritage. That is um, whether countries had a history of having been colonized in the year 1900, um, and of economic so sovereignty, which is basically whether countries were um, imperialist powers, independent or colonies in the year 1900. 
And we find that um, these measures of colonialism have a pretty strong explanatory power, but they do not overrule our finding of the persistence in, in productive capabilities. Okay, then there's of course a question of whether we have a problem with omitted variable bias. So we have constructed an instrument where we basically draw on, the, um, on an instrument that has been established for more recent years, for example, by Fryer, um, where, um, where um, in the trade literature, they have used the fact that um, the switch from using um, ships to transport goods um, to using airplanes um, has been heterogeneous and have used this as a time varying instrument for panel regressions. So we are taking inspiration from that and are drawing on a paper by Pascali from 2017 in the AR, um, where he is um, studying the, the, the switch from um, sail ships to steamships, and we are using his data um, to, which gives us a, a, a heterogeneous impact of the change in shipping times from the switch from sail to steam, since uh, due to the wind patterns for some routes, this change in shipping time is very large and for other routes, it's much smaller. Why would that be relevant to our question? Well, this heterogeneous change in shipping time um, would impact cost of transportation and as such would in some sense impact the closeness between economies. So based on the most common workhorse model in, in trade economics, that is a gravity model, we would um, expect that countries that benefit um, from this uh, uh, reduced shipping time in, in greater ways at this critical moment in the 19th century, when initial trade patterns are being set, would experience um, a, a, a greater export diversification than others. Why would um, the exclusion criteria be fulfilled? Well, this was a one-off change in, 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 in shipping um, technology, um, which has then been overruled by the opening of the Panama Canal and also by the shift to air freight. So there's not much reason to assume why this shift would um, operate on today's export patterns other than um, due to its effect on historical export patterns. Okay, we basically find um, this year, the, we, we run again our OLS, um, and then we have our first stage regression here where we basically find that this broadly speaking works as an instrument. We also find that there's an attenuation bias. So, the, the, the results are actually stronger for the instrumented um, uh, uh, regression than for the one um, that, 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 that does not rely on an instrument. Okay, so in conclusion, we find descriptively that the first globalization was a time of great polarization, not of great specialization, which, which implies such a hierarchy of diversification and a hierarchy um, of productive capabilities. Secondly, we find that productive capabilities are persistent across the two globalizations and with them are those export patterns. Um, and thirdly, we find that productive capabilities in the first globalization are very powerful predictor of income levels today. Finding number two and three are robust to controlling for correlates today controlling for geography, controlling for institutions and colonial history, as well as to all sorts of ways in which we can vary the measures that we are using and are also um, uh, robust to varying our contemporary reference period, periods. And omitted variable bias has been uh, ruled out, we hope, by instrumenting with the change in shipping time. Thanks so much for your attention. Great, thank you so much, um, all of all three presenters uh, for your very interesting presentation. So we have quite a bit of time for discussion. We do have a couple of questions that have already come in um, into the Q and A. Um, a couple for Louisa and one for John. And I um, would assume that people are still typing <laughs> some questions for Isabella. So maybe what we'll do is. Um, is uh, let the three presenters again go through and um, 
and answer the questions. And um, as, as they come in, we can, we can kind of add more. And um, I can also, Isabella, move Gregor into the room in case, in case that's helpful. So I think that this is how I do that. <laughs> All right. Um, OK, so right now, maybe what we should do is um, start with Louisa. Um, and maybe go in, in the order of the presentations um, and then see where we end up. So the Q&A, um, if you could sort of repeat the questions, that'd be great. Thank you so much, Leila. Yeah, I'm guessing that the attendees cannot read the Q&A or should I? Okay. I don't think they can. I'm not, I, I don't think so. so I'm not totally sure. I'll read, I'll read the questions. Uh, so there are two questions by David Cotts, and I'll read the two of them, uh, one after the other, and address that first. And there's one from Gregor. Uh, so Professor Cotts says, what do you think of the alternative approach of regarding domestic labor as indirectly affecting the value of labor power and the rate of exploitation without directly producing value or surplus value? And then follow up on domestic labor question. If domestic labor is treated as creating new value and new surplus value appropriated by capitalists, that causes problem for the theory of value and exploitation. For example, domestic labor does not produce something for a capitalist to sell. So how would the hours of domestic labor appear as new value in the commodity sold by the capitalists? Uh, so, I think what I'm saying is something in between those two things. I agree that it does not produce surplus value because it is not directly appropriated by the capitalists to sell, but I do think it does create value. Uh, but I agree as well that it's indirectly affecting the value of labor power and the rate of exploitation. Uh, the part of, uh, of saying that it does not create value, I think the problem with that is that in a way, you would be saying that it's not labor. So there is a, a bit of a political problem in my understanding of that. Uh, so there are hours of labor embodied in the commodities that are created by domestic labor. Those commodities are not sold by the capitalists, but they still exist and are consumed. Uh, they do not create surplus value because they're not sold. They indirectly affect the value of labor power because it allows for a higher, well, directly affect because it allows for a different understanding of what's socially and historically necessary for the labor power to be, uh, to reproduce itself. And it affects the capacity of, uh, of the capitalist of exploiting more or less. So it could allow for a higher rate of exploitation. I don't know if that's making sense. Uh, so yes, I agree that there is no it's not adding to the labor embodied in the commodities that are being sold by the capitalists. Although even that, we could think a little bit in terms of productivity somehow, the same way that there is somewhat labor embodied when you study, for example. But I don't want to go that far. That's also indirect in some way. I don't know if I answered the question. So if there is any follow-up, uh, please uh, do let me know. Uh, Gregor question is, uh, I was wondering how, if at all, your theory relates to the idea that the capitalist economy relies on non-capitalist inputs, including a non-capitalist subsisting subsistence economy, <clears throat> to which one could presumably count unpaid fem female labor. As the capitalist economy grows relative to the non-capitalist one, the importance of these unpaid inputs decreases and the capitalist economy has to bear more of the costs with consequent downward pressure on the profit rate. Uh, I would agree up to the very last point. I think this is very similar uh, to the Marx code that, I, that I've put there where he says that when women uh, are pulled into the labor force through technical change, this leads them to buy substitute goods uh, in the market. Uh, so this would be this idea of increasing the importance of the capitalist sector versus the non-capitalist sector. What I don't think is that this necessarily creates a downward pressure on the profit rate. I think the pressure on the profit rate will depend on bargaining power and on the, on the class struggle. And I think what I, exactly what I'm trying to say is that the tension that is created uh, by this disruption in this division uh, itself 
might lead to a different uh, to a different pressure on the profit rate, depending on how class struggle reacts to this uh, to this disruption. Great, thank you, um, John. There's one more question for you in there, or oh, comment. Yeah. Um, okay, so. Uh, so the question is, I'll try to uh, boil it down a little bit. So the question is from uh, Robin Hanel, um, saying that uh, they've done some agent-based simulations for a price-guided procedure uh, in the context of doing annual economic planning. Uh, their agents are worker and consumer councils who optimize and they uh, wanted to get a sense of how many iterations it would take in this kind of model to get reasonably close to a general equilibrium. Uh, they said that Robin says that their simulations converge more quickly than the ones that I presented. Um, so he's uh, surprised by the results. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in seeing uh, your, your paper and your, what your simulations, uh, what your simulation results are. Um, and I can send you the write-up of what we have, at least the preliminary write-up that we have so far. Um, but one, I think, reason why we don't get quick uh, convergence is, one, I don't necessarily think there should be convergence. It should be open-ended oscillation. Um, and two, uh, the way that our... Uh, agents operate is that they're not really, they're only kind of pseudo optimizing. The capitalists produce as much as they can in the hopes of getting as much uh, or a higher, a higher profit rate. Uh, but uh, they, the way that prices form at a very local level uh, and the fact that what that means is that each pair of agents is possibly making an, a disequilibrium trade because even though they figure out prices such that there's no excess demand between the two agents, this doesn't mean that the prices that they arrive at are equilibrium prices for the whole economy. So uh, because we have disequilibrium trading, uh, that's going to lead to kind of persistent uh, movement in prices, and I don't think we're going to see anything in our model. I don't think we should expect to see either prices kind of converge to long period that long period equilibrium, or see profit rates converge. I think we would expect to see kind of continued oscillation. And as far as why we don't get that so far, um, I think part of it has to do with just how the decisions uh, of intersectoral mobility are made. I think we need to kind of rethink that a little bit. Great, thank you. Um, and there's one question uh, for Isabella. Yeah, um, thank you, Tom Michael. So uh, Tom Michael asks, how does your result relate to the conditional convergence and absolute convergence among a club of countries found in cross country regressions? So we actually looked at this um, part of the paper that I did not present. Um, and if you don't mind, I'd share my screen um, to show the relevant regression. Um, so this is just on the level of uh, the, the OLS regression. So we have um, productive capabilities measured in terms of diversification complexity, also in terms of a first principle component across these measures um, for 1998 to 2007, which we consider as a like part of a peak of the ongoing globalization. And um, as independent variable, we have um, the effective capabilities measured in the exact same way for the first globalization, controlling for this set of contemporary um, correlates. And this first set of results um, basically looks at um, this for the whole sample of 98 countries for which we have constructed data. And then the, the, the panel B in this table um, distinguishes between IMF advanced countries today and IMF developing countries. And what we find is broadly speaking that yes, there is convergence within the IMF advanced countries, or in other words, the persistence within the IMF advanced countries 
is, um, is not strong, basically hardly significant or not significant at all. Um, whereas um, for the IMF developing countries, it is very salient. Similarly, um, we find that the predictive power um, for um, GDP is stronger on the part of developing countries than um, for the IMF advanced countries. So in other words, um, this suggests that just as the um, convergence club um, hypothesis would hold, there is kind of a convergence club of the what in our data kind of shows up like a cream layer of countries that were like on top of the hierarchy then and are still on top of the hierarchy today, but were in particular the United Kingdom, which in the first globalization was just far ahead of all other countries. I mean, some economic historians have argued that the UK was the switchboard of the world. And as a result of the first industrial revolution, um, just had this, still had this like massive advantage at the turn of the 20th century. But this advantage then erodes in the course of the 20th century with other countries that were already on top of the hierarchy that were also imperialist powers and so on, catching up with the UK or overtaking the UK. Um, but this kind of convergence does not happen in um, the lower parts of the hierarchy um, that we have, have identified at the turn of the 20th century. I'd like to call on Gregor, um, who, who also worked on that part of our paper, um, to see if he would like to add something to that. Oh, thanks. I, I don't think I have anything to add. Um, uh, thanks. I was pretty. Um, okay, there's one thing in the chat. Okay. Um, okay, so if there are any, uh, we, ha we have some more time. So if there are any more questions, um, please feel free to put them in the chat or to in the Q&A or to raise your hands. And um, as I sort of pause for a moment to see if anybody wants to do that, I'll also ask if any of the panelists have any other um, anything else that they would like they would like to say before we wrap up? All right, I know it takes a while to um, to type, so I, I am going to just hold for for one minute <laughs> um, to see if anything comes up. And if not, then I think we might end a few minutes early today. All right. Um, okay, so thanks to the three of you for uh, wonderful presentations. And thank you to all of the attendees for joining. Um, and if there aren't any other other questions, I think we will, we will call it a, a day. Thanks so much, Leila. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Leila, for organizing. Oh, Denya, and thank you to Denya yeah, and Savani for organizing. <laughs> yeah, let's go. Yeah. Okay. All right. Bye. Thank you. Bye.